welcome. Welcome to those of you who are here in the sanctuary and those who are live on Zoom and those who are joining us later on YouTube. Welcome to you all. Are there any announcements before we begin today? Yes, I'll. Um, just a reminder, though, um, I have been getting some orders for the Easter flowers, but um, today I had it this morning, the last day of order, but um, I actually don't have to call it in until, um, I believe it's Thursday, and usually they'll take orders after that, too, because they like to kind of get an idea of how many of are ordering, so if you're still interested in ordering Easter flowers, you can um, fill out a form and leave it here at church, or you can... Um, Give me a phone call and I can take the order on the phone. Uh, the money isn't really due either until after the flowers and you can place a check to take this bill. Up. So you don't need to worry about that. If you want to just place your order, that would be fine. And then uh, in the bulletin that uh, next week we will be uh, receiving our one great hour sharing um, donation. Thank you, Sally. And with the one great hour of sharing, if you send in your donation, just make a note uh, in the memo line of the check uh, how much you go to one great hour of sharing. Because then Andy will write a separate check uh, from the church uh, for that. Other announcements? Yes, Ross? Uh, no. Uh, yes, I know it's in the bulletin, but I did want to mention that uh, pot pie and ham sandwich sale is this Wednesday, um, and, and typically in the morning. So if you did want something for that sale, please call it in to the church number to the and to the as uh, soon as you can. Um, and I think I will mention that uh, I guess most people on Zoom know. Uh, uh, we don't have heat in the sanctuary lately, so we're going to get the, the chimney is clogged up. It needs to be cleaned and redesigned, which we are working on. So I just wanted to let people know that. Thank you. Thanks, Ross. Uh, Linda had mentioned to me she was going to wear her uh, <laughs> mittens today. And uh, I said, I, with my bald head, I, I need to wear my hat. So if you see me next week with my hat on, that's why. Uh, any other announcements this morning? Okay, then we'll begin with our liturgy of diminishing light. There is so much during the day that clamors for our attention. Friends, family, work, classes, household tasks, and the noise. We are bombarded with sound from the clock that awakens us to the telephone, the radio, the television, the conversation that we have heard or overheard. Where is the time and place to listen for the still small voice of God? Sometimes it seems that God would have to speak in a whirlwind to be heard above the clamor. Listen now, there is a place of quiet rest and it is the place where God dwells within you. Close your eyes. Be aware of the place. And let we journey to the parts of ourselves known only to God, beneath the clamor. Let the story of Jesus reach us there. Let it teach us wisdom in our secret hearts. Let's take a time of silence. As we extinguish this light, we acknowledge the darkness and pain of violence in the world and to the earth.
Let us pray. Draw us together in your love, O God. May our restless hearts not resist you, but continue to search until they find their rest in you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear this call to worship. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Please join me in our call to worship. Our lips sing praise and our whole selves rejoice in the God who makes us free. We gather recognizing that not all human beings have known this freedom. The divine will was made known in Eden and in Egypt, in Gettysburg and in Cape Town. Born in freedom, redeemed from slavery, our destiny in Christ is liberty. Let us lift our hearts together in our opening prayer. We gather in this place not because we are deserving of your love and not because we have lived faithfully before your face. We gather here because you have called us. You loved us before we could love you. You have given your Son for our salvation. For this we join all creation in blessing you, praising you, thanking you. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, you are great and greatly to be praised. As we offer our praise, we long for you to mold us in the image of your Son, whose death and resurrection give us hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now we'll listen to our hymn of praise, God of grace and God of glory. Teach us the wisdom that comes only through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Is not this the fast I choose? To loose the bonds of injustice, to share your bread with the hungry, to bring the homeless poor into your house, to clothe the naked, then your light shall break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up quickly. Having heard these promises, let us confess our sins. Almighty God, in Jesus Christ you love us, but we have not loved you. You have opened your heart to us, and in our pride we have spurned your care. You have given us all things, and we have squandered your gifts. 
We have grieved you and caused hurt to others, and we are not worthy to be called your children. Have mercy on us, O Lord, for we are ashamed and sorry for all we have done to displease you. Cleanse us from our sin and receive us again into your household, that we might never more stray from your love, but always remain within the sound of your voice. Amen. The God who brought the Israelites out of Egypt is the power that frees us from our sin. Live in the grace of God's love as you walk in the way of Jesus and surely you shall find mercy at the end of the road. Amen. And now we'll hear the reading of our Holy Scriptures. Our first reading is from Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, sea, and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God has given you. <clears throat> you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Our second reading is Psalm 19. <clears throat> the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky proclaims its maker's handiwork. One day tells its tale to another and one night imparts knowledge to another. Although they have no words or language and their voices are not heard, their sound has gone out into all lands and their message to the ends of the world where God has pitched a tent for the sun. It comes forth like a bridegroom out of his chamber. It rejoices like a champion to run its course. It goes forth from the uttermost edge of the heavens and runs about to the end of it again. Nothing is hidden from its burning heat. The teaching of the Lord is perfect and revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the simple. The statutes of the Lord are just and rejoice the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear and gives light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, more than much fine gold, sweeter far than honey, than honey in the comb. By them also is your servant enlightened, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can detect one's own offenses? Cleanse me from my secret faults. Above all, keep your servant from presumptuous sin. Let them not get dominion over me. Then shall I be whole and sound and innocent of a great offense. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Our third reading is 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. 
The message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Our gospel lesson today is found in the gospel according to John from chapter 2, verses 13 through 26. Listen for the word of God. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to, to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, and sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at the tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume you. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And the Jews said, then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. We got a blessing to this reading from God's holy word. Our gospel lesson tells us this morning that Jesus and his disciples traveled to Jerusalem and that the Passover was near. For the people of the Jewish faith, which included Jesus and his disciples, the Passover is one of the most important festivals. It was a pilgrimage that the Jewish people made to Jerusalem each year. Sacrifices are made and temple taxes are paid. The festivals are a time of remembering, of retelling the story of God's work in their lives, and a time of reliving the past through the story. And ensuring that the story lives on by its retelling year after year. So there are three main pilgrimage festivals. Times when those who are able to travel through Jerusalem to take part of the religious rite. And during these religious festivals, great crowds would gather in Jerusalem. In fact, the Jewish historian named Josephus, he estimated that approximately for a big number, 2,700,000 people would gather in Jerusalem during the time of the Holy Festival. Some others report that the average population of Jerusalem at that time was about only about 25,000. So imagine the number of people that would come into the city during the time of the festivals. The population would increase by one and a half million people. 
whether Josephus' number was over exaggerated or not, there was a huge increase in the population. The streets had to have been crowded. It must have been nearly impossible to maneuver in those streets. I am a person, regardless of COVID, who doesn't like crowds. And so I can imagine what it would be like to attend a festival in that huge town. As all of these people were coming in to pay their temple taxes, to make their sacrifices, to atone for their sins, and to remember. And this is something that they've done and do year after year from the time they're born. And so I also imagine that. I make this pilgrimage on foot with my family. For some of these people, they travel very long distances. And so when you travel such a long distance to make your sacrifice at this temple, it would be very difficult to bring a sacrifice animal with you. And the animal that you're sacrificing had to be the best. There had to not be any blemishes upon this sacrificial animal. So they had to buy it when they got there because they couldn't take a chance of bringing an animal and have something happen to it along the way. And then we hear about the money changers. So in the temple, they were not allowed to accept Greek or Roman coins because it had the upper head on them, a human image, an idol. So they had to exchange their coins that they use in their daily lives for other currency to use in the temple. And so you have the crowd, you have the animals, you have the merchants. That brought the animals there, the money changers, lots of commotion, all of this for this holy festival, for the Passover. It's what, it, it's what needed to be done. And it gets done year after year. It's like we celebrate our religious holidays year after year. We're, we're in our Lenten season and we'll be having Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday, things that we do. But Jesus shows up at the festival and he's angry. Why is he so angry? So angry that he makes a whip and he drives out the sheep and the cattle, he turns over the tables, he yells at the self sellers, and he said, stop making God's house mercifully. Now, if you were there, especially if you were there as one of the merchants, you may be incensed. You know, you have taken the time to bring the dogs or maybe the cows to the temple. And you're doing a service for God. You knew the people that have made this long pilgrimage couldn't bring it on their own. They, they had to have them there. And so that's what you did. And it's a way that you could give back to God and the community. And maybe it started out this way. And maybe it remained this way. We don't know. But Jesus was upset because. It seemed like there were people there for their own benefit to swindle people out of their hard earned money. After all, if you're exchanging people's money coins, it's not like we have a, a sheet we can go by and see what the exchange rate is. They made their own exchange rate. And maybe they were fair, maybe they weren't. So when Jesus came into that 
temple and he looked around and he saw what was going on, he was witnessing apparently a religious institution that was in need of reform. And he saw people in need of reform. He walked into a place where people came to worship, or a place where people came to honor God and make a permit to God, to give thanks for God for the, all of the blessings that God has bestowed upon them, all the blessings that God bestowed upon us. But instead, Jesus walks into a scene of chaos. And he walked into what was supposed to be a holy religious ceremony where people were there to honor God and remember the story of God and how God saved them. He came into a scene where people were supposed to be honoring their neighbor as well, but they were not performing that. The Passover preparation had somehow become simply an act of duty. And so it misrepresented the original intent of the law that Moses had passed down from God. He came upon a scene, Jesus came upon a scene where everything was askew, which probably happened little by little over time. Instead of remembering the story, the message, they have forgotten the true intent that that festival was supposed to bring about. So I don't know, sure, but it's my assumption that in the beginning, when those people first came to the temple, and started selling the animals and exchanging the money. It was probably done for very good and great reason to actually assist those pilgrims who made such a long journey to actually properly celebrate that festival. But again, I don't know, but I'm guessing over time things change little by little until how things were happening at that time became status quo. After all, that happens to us, doesn't it? The way things have always been done, so we keep doing them. Little changes happen, but we continue to do them over and over again. With no one seeing the need to before. Jesus entered a place that forgot its original purpose. As I was preparing um, and looking at reading one of my commentaries that I refer to, speaking on the word, a scholar named Paul Shoot said they, meaning the temple authorities, uh, the ones who studied the word of God, as they were committed to building up institutions to proclaim and embody that word. And yet somehow they managed to accommodate the money change. He goes on to say that it is doubtful that the system was ever a fully cynical exploitation of God's goodness. More than likely, all involved had simply settled into comfortable behaviors that enabled them to meet institutional goals, turning an increasingly blind eye to the unsavory possibilities of corruption inherent in changing money. So I wonder what about us today? What about the churches today? Have we simply settled into uncomfortable behaviors? Have we increasingly turned a blind eye? Are we coming to church on Sundays? And by Monday, we have gone back to becoming money changers? It's very easy as a church 
as its people to get comfortable, to get settled into the ways that we've always done things. And when we get settled into the ways of how they've always been done, it's easy for the original teachings to get lost, for our message to become skewed, little by little. Not intentionally, at least not at first, but nonetheless, it's easy for our message to get skewed. Jesus came into the temple and he realized what was happening. And Jesus could not let it continue. He just couldn't stand by and watch it all going on. And so he, in no uncertain terms, lets the people know that there's a problem here in this temple. And like Jesus calls out the religious authorities and demands that they reevaluate what they're doing for us, especially during our Lenten season, Jesus calls us to look at how we may intentionally or unintentionally how we might be skewing the message that Jesus has brought to us as well. We do this again little by little. The religious leaders and others who were witness to Jesus' anger and actions on that day wanted an explanation. And if you were there, you would probably have wanted an explanation too. So Jesus says, as we read in our scripture, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And then the authority said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body, he said. Although they, the religious authorities and those who were there didn't understand what Jesus meant by this. After Jesus was crucified and raised, the disciples remembered that he said this. And they understood after the fact that it's not the building that Jesus was upset about. It wasn't the building that Jesus was upset about because Jesus is God's temple. And we are to worship Jesus. Our religious ceremonies and festivals and rites and worship are put into place to honor God and God's people. God's people, which is everyone. If you listen to my midweek message this week, I use as my focus scripture our Hebrew lesson, which was the Ten Commandments. And I said that if we honor the two greatest commandments, which Jesus tells us are the two greatest commandments, Jesus says, are to honor God with our heart, and mind, and strength, and the second is like it, to love our neighbors as ourselves. If we honor just those two basic commandments, then by default, we are obeying all of these things. Because we cannot honor God and our neighbor if we are doing the things that we're told not to do. Things like stealing or coveting or murdering or anything else that is not done in love. And that is why Jesus was so upset when he came upon the scene in the temple. When we read and listen to this gospel lesson, are we able to see reforms that we need to take, maybe in our church, maybe in our community, maybe in our country? When we listen to our religious leaders and read our holy scriptures, are we following Jesus' true teachings? Or are we following the status quo, which others say, 
culturally, this is how we do it. It's very easy to become complacent. It's very easy to do what has always been done. And we do these things often without realizing what we're doing. In fact, we often do these things thinking we're doing the right thing. Like the people who came for that Passover festival. But throughout history, we're always told to look at ourselves and to make changes when necessary. Throughout history, recognition of what to fall for. Jesus called recognition in that temple. Luther and Calvin and Zwingli called for reformation. Martin Luther King Jr. and Desmond Tutu and Pope Francis, who is making his trip to Rome, and many others have called for reformation. During this lesson season, may we all look into our hearts, look for God's message in this world and we form our own temples because, as we heard, the true temple is the body of Christ. And when Jesus was crucified and raised, and when he physically left this world, we became the body of Christ. And we are called to do Christ's work in this world. And it may just mean that there will be times when we have to turn over some tables for Christ's sake and for the sake of our neighbors. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to teach us how to live, how to love, how to be your faithful servant. Thank you, Lord, for sending us the many faithful servants throughout history that serve as examples for us, that remind us of your loving message. When we come, when we become so busy leading our own lives, help us to remember that you came for us. We pray that we can be examples of your message and offer love and hope and a new life in Jesus Christ to all that we encounter. Amen. And now as Christ's disciples, we are called to make our offering. Our tokens offered here are but symbols of our lives of sacrifice lived every day. May we give ourselves to the world as a holy offering acceptable to you, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. <laughs>
Let us now lift our hearts together in our intercessory prayers of the people. Relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, and all in need. There is no God before you. Purify the faith of your church, that your people place their trust in nothing beside you. Your name is holy. Guide your church that in every situation, your people's words and actions honor your name. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. The heavens declare your glory. Renew your creation. Provide leaders in the struggle for clean air and water. Protect creatures and crops that rely on healthy ecosystems. Give all people the willingness to repent when our way of life pollutes the earth and sky. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Your foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. Fill leaders with the foolishness of your peace and mercy. Your law defends the vulnerable. Work through legislators, judicial systems, and systems of law enforcement to protect the well-being and freedom of all. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Your weakness is stronger than human strength. Protect those who are vulnerable and give courage to all who are suffering. Defend victims of crime and bring redemption to those who have harmed others. Give Sabbath rest to all who labor. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. You call us to proclaim Christ crucified. Give clarity to this congregation and our leaders so that we might follow Christ beyond our own habits and comfort. Clear out anything in our common life that would obscure the gospel or that serves our own interests. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Are there others who would like to lift up today in prayer? To pray all. Hear us, O oh God, mercy. your mercy is great. And bless the water. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We pray for all those on our prayer list, all those who long to be with us but are, are unable for whatever reason. We pray for all those who are cold and hungry, all those who are ill and have no access to medical treatment or medication. We especially pray for all those who have needs that they cannot express aloud. We pray that you would hear us, O oh God, for your mercy is great. The cross of Christ is your power for all who are being saved. Thank you for all the martyrs whose witness reveals the power of the cross. Give us the same trust in life and in death. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O oh faithful God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. And now let us pray as Jesus has taught us to pray as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now let us listen to our closing hymn, In the Cross of Christ I Glory. Thank mm -hmm. you.
weakness of the holy is stronger than every human power. Live free. And the God who brought the Israelites out of Egypt, the God who freed the Menedi from slavery, will be your strength and your power. Amen. And may the peace of God, which does surpass all our understanding, be with you now. Thank you.